So today we are going to look at how vibrations and accelerations can be measured in the high voltage environment, an application that gets more and more common when it comes to testing of electric and hybrid vehicles. And I want to begin with a story, a true story I experienced myself and I still remember very well when my phone rang in 2016. On the other end was an engineer from a very prestigious vehicle manufacturer from Saffen, Germany and he said, uh, we are about to launch the Zero Series of an electric vehicle and now the power rails between inverter and engine are tearing off in our plant. Can you offer us something for measuring vibrations at high voltage potential? And I remember very well that I first had to sit back because we didn't have anything like that on offer at that time. And I simply said, okay, let me talk to my management on the phone. Six weeks later, the man had his acceleration measurement results on the desk and he knew exactly which vibrations were tearing his bus parts apart. He knew which frequencies were to blame for those issues and they could solve those issues within a few days. And our solution at that time of, was, of course, an absolute special solution, not yet nearly integrated into our software environment and also the measurement technology not yet optimal. It was real beta stage stuff. However, it was enough for our customer to be able to draw important conclusions out of that data. Well, since then, we have, of course, gained a lot of experience in that field. And today, these solutions, of course, are technically completely mature. They have been tested quite extensively and the modules are in service at a lot of customers. And in the next 25 minutes, I want to share some of this experience with you. And we will be, will be dealing with a few important questions. What are accelerations and where do they occur in the vehicle? Why is it that vibrations are so critical in the vehicle in the first place? And which sensors and measuring devices can we use to measure accelerations and vibrations in the vehicle at a high voltage safe manner? So there are in fact a lot of applications where acceleration measurements in vehicles are common and necessary. And we will just take a look at a few of them. For example, it's very common that manufacturer of components, the supplier who delivers components to the OEM, gives certain limit values along the way for those components and also limits for acceleration and vibration. And now you can imagine that if we now install and operate this component in the vehicle together with many other components, then it is not unlikely that these limit values are exceeded. And this must be checked because it would have a negative impact on these components. And of course, there are also liability and legal reasons for this. Another application is that we have to verify simulation models, for example, of battery housings. And those housings are modeled using the finite animal, uh, element analysis. And these calculations, of course, have to be checked in practice to see if simulation meets reality. Then it is also all about the transmission rates of vibrations, for example, on conductor rails. Just imagine that you have two heavy components and a conductor rail between them. And these two components are now moving differently. So they are, of course, loads on the conductor rails. And we naturally also want to determine these to be sure that they are not taking damage due to those vibrations. What's more, in the vehicle, essentially all relevant components are suspended with holder damper systems so that they are not experiencing all the vibrations from the road and so-called load profiles are determined in road testing. And with these load profiles and with this measured data, we would then go to the test stand, for example, and there this data is replayed on the test bench, on the shaker, so that the test driver doesn't have to do it all the time. And the test stand can, of course, test 24-7. And another very important application is, of course, crash testing. And this is also where particularly high and violent accelerations occur. 
And finally, we have special applications such as drop tests of batteries for safety reasons. There are various standards that have to be complied with, and we will go to that later in our practical examples. Well, all in all, the acceleration measurement is all about this. All the vibrations and all the accelerations are essentially not good for the lifetime of our components and our vehicle. And of course, we have to ensure safety. That's why measurements have to be taken both on the test bench and in road tests. And of course, we also want to check all the simulations under real conditions with measurement technology. Okay, now let's take a brief, a really brief look at what acceleration basically is. Acceleration is defined as a change in the state of motion of a body. And you can simply imagine that you sit down in your car and you just drive off. So we accelerate from zero, for example, to 100 kilometers per hour and a force affects on your body. In this example, the car is our mass and we have uh, a change in the magnitude of speed, a change in the velocity. And we simply call that change of speed acceleration. And if you brake, it would be the same thing. And then that is a negative acceleration. Now, if we constantly drive with 100 kilometers per hour and then into a curve, that means that you don't actually change your speed, but you change the direction of the speed. And thereby, here's now a new acceleration, and that new acceleration pushes you sideways, and that means that also a change of the direction of the speed can be an acceleration. Now let's take a look at accelerations in different dimensions of space. We take a wheel and this wheel here rolls purposefully over the blue plane and we now have a force in a single direction. And now we place some obstacles across the driving direction on our blue plane and the wheel has to jump over the lefts. That means we have now an acceleration in two directions. And finally, we put more obstacles on it. And now our wheel is moved and accelerated in all three dimensions of space. Well, and this is very important for the selection of a suitable sensor because a uniaxial sensor only shows the direction, uh, the acceleration exactly in one specific dimension. Biaxial sensors and then in two dimensions and all uh, a triaxial sensor, of course, in all three dimensions. So depending on the specific directions in which we expect acceleration, we must, of course, select the appropriate sensor to measure accelerations correctly. Now let's have a look at what kind of acceleration values we actually encounter in real life. Acceleration is measured in meters per second squared, which is the corresponding SI unit, but most of the time we work with the unit G. And 1G is the acceleration due to gravity at the equator. This is 9.81 meters per second squared. And if you were to leave the Earth now in direction of the sky, or you walk into the direction of one of the poles, the acceleration due to gravity becomes somewhat lower. Well, with a bicycle, you can accelerate by 0.2G, with a normal car by 0.5G. A racing car can even accelerate by 3 to 4G. And if you take uh, the, the, the spin cycle of a washing machine, it, it can accelerate by up to 600 G. And a sewing machine needle, when it really gets going, can accelerate by up to 6000 G. And now I have a little estimation question for you. We would like to, you to take actively part today. Just imagine we had a battery pack, a fairly large battery pack, and we dropped it from a height of five meters onto a concrete floor. What kind of acceleration do you think will occur in the battery when it hits the ground at the bottom? And my team is now about to show us our survey. So you have the opportunity to take part. So, well, answer A would be approximately 600 G, answer B 2800 G, and answer C was over 10,000 G. And you can click on the screen and just, just uh, yeah, guess what kind of accelerations are going to happen to occur inside that battery. 
Yeah, and you're taking part. I can see that here. Perfect. We will wait just a few more seconds for the, all the other guys to take part. Just click on the screen for your answer you want. Okay, I think we will close the survey now. Thank you very much for taking part. And at this point, we will just continue and I will show you the answer later so that it remains exciting. Then we will take a look at what it really looks like in reality. So let's move on to the subject of oscillation. Oscillations are also accelerations, but in this case, there are accelerations that in principle repeat themselves with a constant change of direction. And if a component oscillates particularly quickly and also levels off at a resonant, resonant frequency, for example, then we also call this vibration. And everybody probably knows this. You have seen your own car's mirror vibrate like this before. These are simply vibrations. Or maybe when you were driving, you had that annoying sound in your ear when it kept rattling or something like this. That's another use case where it's very important to measure vibrations, for example. Okay, now we are going to talk about what we have to consider when measuring accelerations. What do we have to take into account when measuring? We can measure the acceleration of a body with a so-called acceleration sensor. And depending on which one we choose, this acceleration sensor shows either one, two, or in all three directions of space, the respective acceleration. And of course, it's also a question of which sensor we choose because sensor types have different properties, advantages and disadvantages. And depending on what exactly we want to investigate now, we have to choose the right sensor for it. As an example, you can see here in the table that if we were to examine circuit boards, we would expect accelerations of between 3 and 2000 hertz. For structure borne sound examinations, the acceleration frequency would be would be significantly higher up to 30,000 hertz. And for durability tests, it goes up to 500 hertz. But the special thing here is that we also want to measure down to zero hertz, a static acceleration. We'll get to that in a moment. Or airborne sound, another special thing here is that it also goes up to 30,000 hertz and it actually stops at 20 hertz downwards because no human ear can actually hear lower frequencies than that. So let's take a look at acceleration sensors. We have basically three different types that we would like to show you today. There are the most common ones. And of course, there are always a few more, but we have selected these three most important types for you. The first type is the capacitive sensor. These capacitive sensors are essentially based on Wheatstone measuring bridges. And they these sensors are very good at low g-forces. They resolve them very finely. We have bandwidths from 0 to 300 hertz, which means they can also measure static accelerations. And what does that mean? So if we just put the sensor on the table and it doesn't move, it shows us the acceleration due to gravity. It shows us the Earth acceleration. Well, if we put it on the table with the right side upwards. But it has to be powered in a relatively complex way. Usually they have a bridge circuit with a six wire technology. Um, however, there are sensor, uh, uh, sensor types that already have a built in electronics and those can be powered more easily with a four wire technology. And a typical application would be, for example, if you wanted to measure the 800 liter tank of a truck, which is attached to the frame of the truck in a damped manner, then you would measure with capacitive sensors. That would be a, a really good choice for that application. The next type are the piezo-resistive sensors. Their outstanding feature is that they are very, very robust. So they are therefore very often used in crash tests. They are also based on Wheatstone measuring bridges, and which means that they therefore must be connected to a bridge amplifier also with the corresponding supply. And finally, let's take 
talk about the very common IEPE sensors, which some of you probably know as ICP sensors. That's a registered trademark of the company PCB. Um, these sensors offer a very wide range of applications that they can cover, but they have a small disadvantage. They only measure from 2 hertz up to 20,000 hertz. So they do not measure 0 hertz and therefore no static acceleration. Why is that? Because they use a different type of supply. With the IEPE sensor, an impressed current is sent into the sensor and the sensor modulates the measurement signal onto this impressed current and sends the modulated current back to the measuring device. And to not measure the impressed current, the supply, with your acceleration values, the DC component is decoupled with a high pass filter. This means, however, that we cannot see this DC comp component. And therefore, IEPE sensors are not capable of measuring zero hertz. Nevertheless, there are various applications and these IEPE sensors are very well regarded in the automotive industry and are used for very, for, for many applications, for a lot of applications. Okay, let's assume we chose a sensor type for our application and now we also need the suitable measuring device for it depending on which sensor we are using. And we must of course select a measuring device that provides the corresponding measuring inputs. Of course, we always have to look at how fast we have to measure in order to record our expected accelerations as frequencies range from 1 hertz to 100 kilohertz and in special cases up to 1 megahertz. And depending on the design of the sensor, it's also a question of what measuring range our measuring device needs. For example, from a few millivolts up to 5 volts, for example, if we take IEPE sensors. And if we are measuring in electrified vehicles, it's also a question of where to attach our sensors. If we simply measure it somewhere outside on the car's body, we don't have to take high voltages into account. But if we are measuring on a bus bar, for example, where we might have a potential of 800 volts, then of course we have to use suitable measuring devices. We need high voltage safe measuring technology. And finally, it's also a question of who is allowed to install these sensors and measure with them. We have to observe the relevant laws. So now let's take a quick look at an entire measurement chain. We chose a suitable uh, acceleration sensor for standard environments up to 60 volts and we have a signal cable in this case here for IEPE sensors and here we see some examples from CSM from us to measure accelerations in environments up to 60 volts. CAN bus based measuring devices are only suitable for very slow accelerations and if we want to go faster we have our EtherCAT based 84i X series, which provides the needed fine measuring ranges and also the corresponding sensor supply. Those devices manage sampling rates of up to uh, 100 kilohertz and some of them up to one megahertz. They are very robust, so the, you can use them in road testing. And so this is what it lo would look like with an 84 IE100 module, which also provides the supply voltage for our IPE sensor. And this is what a non-HV measuring chain would look like. So today we want to talk about e-mobility and high voltage environment. And here the whole thing looks quite different. We still have a suitable acceleration sensor here, which is placed somewhere in the HV environment, in the high voltage environment. And that means that we need a safe, uh, insulated signal cable. Here we see CSM's K960 signal cable for IPE sensors, which is also color coded accordingly with orange and black to lead our accelerations out of the high voltage area through this cable clamp and our measuring device is outside the HV area and because the possibly emerging high voltages on the signal cable, we need other measuring devices. We need high voltage safe measurement technology. 
And here you see how high voltage safe measurement technology from CSM looks like. Here in the middle is a measuring device for measuring IEPE sensors, the IEPE free FL100, or for the pH resistive sensors with bridge circuit, we also have here measuring modules to measure weak stone bridges, high voltage safe, of course, with the corresponding same and better properties than the normal ones. And of course, supplemented by additional properties which concern the high voltage safety, namely high voltage safe connector. This bracket here guarantees that the, can, uh, the connector cannot break off and the device is has a reinforced insulation according to EN61010 um, so that the high voltages cannot jump onto our bus systems or the supply. And of course, the modules are type tested and each module is having a complete high voltage check before the delivery. So here comes the entire high voltage safe measurement chain. We have our acceleration sensor, the high voltage safe cable with the high voltage safe plug here and our appropriately protected measuring device. And so we can connect those high voltage safe modules to our standard bus systems. And this is a high voltage safe measuring chain for acceleration sensors. And there's one thing that's very important in this context. With this solution, you can also use your old sensors from the standard environment in the high voltage environment. Of course, you have to take some things into account, how to mount the sensor safely, but that would go beyond the scope of our presentation today. My key message here is you can use your common sensors with this measurement technology in a high voltage safe manner. Now let's take a look at a few practical examples. You remember our slide from the beginning with all those applications. And first of all, let's take a look at the transmission rates of vibrations on bus bars. And in our example here, we have taken a high voltage battery, which we have simply cut open here. And you can see the different battery modules, which are connected to each other via these orange bus bars. And while our vehicle is moving, these battery, battery modules have a relative movement to each other. They move differently. And this, of course, ensures that these rigid bus bars are exposed to corresponding vibrations and accelerations. And these accelerations can become so strong that in extreme cases, this can lead to a, a crack in the bus bar and this would cause the battery to fail. And this must be, of course, avoided at all costs. And that is why we have to measure accelerations at these bus bars in order to be able to say how the bus bars are mechanically loaded. Here in our case, we have taken two capacitive acceleration sensors, applied them to the bus bar, and the cables, of course, have to be secured with appropriate strain relief so that the sensors do not measure the acceleration of the cable themselves. And now we lead that uh, how those high voltage safe cables out of the battery using sealed cable glands. And in this case, for the capacitive acceleration transducers, we use another high voltage safe measuring module, namely our high voltage 84 IF1000, a high voltage safe measuring module for measuring the smallest voltages, which and which provides several sensor supplies at the same time. And this is how you can record these capacitive acceleration transducers really easily. Now we are switching over to another applications and let's take a look at suspension and uh, bracket and damper systems and how they are tested. They are tested on the bad road. That means the vehicle is now equipped with acceleration sensors and other measurement technology and we drive over a defined bad road and we want to know how our acceleration propagates from the wheel to the relevant components. That is from the wheel to the wishbone, from the wishbone to the axle beam, from the axle beam to the car body and from the car body now, for example, to our component here, our bus bar. Well, dampening elements are installed everywhere, which means that our acceleration should be reduced from component to component. And in order to check this, it would be necessary 
to measure at the, the acceleration in front and behind of the dampening element in order to be able to determine the transfer behavior of the acceleration, so to speak. And now it is important here that we also have components that lie on high voltage potential. Of course, our wheel is not at high voltage potential and neither is our wishbone, but our bus bar is at high voltage potential. And that means that we now also need a mixed, a combined and synchronized, me synchronized measurement of acceleration sensors in standard and high voltage environment at the same time. And here you can see how such a solution looks like with CSM equipment. We have standard modules for the non-HV sensors. And on the right side, we have our high voltage safe modules for the sensors in high voltage environment. And they can now operate synchronized while they are connected via the Ethercat bus system and send their data to our XCP gateway and from there to a data logger or a laptop computer. And they are perfectly synchronized via this Ethercat bus system. Well, let's take a quick look at some measurement data. What would something like this look like in practice? So those signals here were measured on an oil cooler. And the application case is that we hit the curb with our wheels. We drive over the curb with our wheels. So now you can see that a triaxial accelerometer was used. We have three curves. And we would have expected that the acceleration on the Z axis would be much higher than the other two. But we see here that there are significant acceleration values in all three dimensions of space. And this simply shows again how important it is to record the accelerations in all three directions of space. So now we have recorded our accelerations on the bad road sections. We gathered data for a load level, um, for a load level profile, and we usually take these load profiles at our test stand and we put the vehicles on shakers and then these profiles are replayed. And the benefit is we don't need a driver for that anymore and we can focus on specific frequencies that are generating issues and thus speed up testing by testing the most relevant cases, the most relevant frequencies. Okay, here's our application overview again. And now we move on to a third case, which is particularly close to my heart because I accompanied such a project as a sales engineer. It's about a drop test of a high voltage battery. Various countries have certain requirements that they want battery manufacturers to meet in order to be allowed to import and use HV batteries in this country. In Korea, for example, there's the Korea Motor Vehicle Safety Standard. And this standard now stipulates that the battery pack must be dropped from a height of 4.9 meters with a state of charge of 80% and hit a concrete floor. And maybe you remember our estimation question before, and this is exactly the test we did there. Here it is necessary to do a combined measurement of acceleration centers, both in the non-high voltage and in the high voltage environment. Why is that? Here we have our battery pack. And um, there are inside the battery, there are placed um, acceleration sensors in a high voltage safe manner. But also outside the battery pack, accelerometers have to be placed because when this battery pack now hits the ground, it hits first with the edge of its housing and the acceleration wave, the shock wave, only then propagates into the interior of the battery. So do you simply want to see how these acceleration signals propagate in the battery and that's why we need non-high voltage safe and high voltage safe acceleration sensors equally and fully synchronized. And here for the high voltage safe measurement we used the IEPE 3 FL100 and the non-high voltage measurements were carried out with fast standard measurements modules from CSM and both ty type of modules record simultaneously and synchronously data from the sensors of from inside and outside of the battery and both types of measurement modules um, there were several modules of each type in this case were connected 
uh, to each other via the EtherCAT bus, the green lines here, and the measurement data is collected and synchronized by an XCP gateway. This is this module. And the XCP gateway transfers the signals to the measuring computer via XCP on Ethernet, which is a standard bus system. And a data acquisition software is now running here. In our case, CanAP or vMeasure Expert. Both software suits are products by our partner company, Vector Informatic. Okay, now let's take a look at how much acceleration a high voltage battery experiences in that test. And maybe my team can show the results of your vote. Uh, yeah, we just take a look at the vote. Um, one third of you thought that it are around 600 G. 22% of you thought we have over 10,000 G and the most part of you, 44%, thought that we have 2,800 G. And perfect, let's fade back to our presentation and I will finally reveal the result now. It's over 10,000 G. It's nearly unbelievable that 10,000 G occur in the battery when this battery hits the concrete floor there. It's unimaginable how hard the impact is and how high the acceleration values are inside the battery here. So finally, I have summarized for you which sensors are suitable for measuring accelerations in conventional and high voltage environments. We have the sensitive capacitive sensors, the piezo resistive sensors, which are particularly robust, and our IPE sensors, which simply offer a very wide range of applications. And of course, you also need the appropriate measurement technology. And I hope I could show you that we from CSM provide a comprehensive set of measurement modules for all the different sensor types for high voltage environment and of course for standard environment because as you know as you know your toolbox should always be well equipped then it is easiest to work